JJ, welcome back. It's episode 14 of We Were Gamers. Hello, Andrew. Good to be back. <laughs> right on, man. Do you... I, I kind of, in my head, I picture the opening music right before we start to get myself psyched out. It's a good beat, man. It's a really good beat. I like that song. I know we put it in later, so you can't really jam out to it, but I kind of put it on in my head. Yeah, that's like a really cool, uh, like, mental... It's like get it, I'm trying to think. It's like you know, like the Rocky plays the music, you know, and he's running up the steps. And it's like da da, yeah, pretty cool. <laughs> I'm slightly trepidatious today, JJ. It's my last day on quote unquote stable internet. Oh, I'm gonna try and switch over to Time Warner starting tomorrow. Oh, okay. I scheduled it for the day after the podcast. In the, smart, smart. Yeah, yeah, just in case. I mean, you know, I, I have the capability to put the podcast up in case your house is down for a week. Yeah, that's true. But it would make it diff more difficult to record, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. But AT&T lost my business, so it's time oh. to figure something else out. Yeah, well, if you've been, you definitely have been complaining to me about some internet problems you've been having, so I think that's the right thing to do. Copy that, man. Well, when we do that, we're getting rid of TV. Yeah, you're going to cut the cord entirely, huh? You know, I don't like that phrase, cut the cord, because I'm still attached to a cord for a major company, you know? Okay, well, I think more people, I think the the people that think about that term, cut the cord, really mean the TV cord. They don't really mean that you're not paying companies because you're paying companies. Yeah. It's just a weird phrase because you're always attached on a cord. Yeah, I just think they more mean the, it's meant like the cable cord, you know, your coax cable, that kind of thing. It's kind of funny because I'm switching to coax after having tried quote unquote fiber, which is basically an excuse for DSL X2, mm. which is what AT&T sells as fiber. Uh, I believe it is fiber to the node, and then the node to your house is copper or DSL, yeah. Which is basically junk, especially because their equipment is, in my opinion, junk. Well, uh, I can provide the counterpoint where I have extremely great and very reliable internet uh, at my house, and I have the same company uh, and service that you are canceling, so I've had no problems with them. I don't get it. I don't understand. It's me and technology, man. It's just me and technology. I'll never be satisfied. My guess is that it's some combination of the area that you live in and the physical house that you live in together conspiring against you. <laughs> I believe it. at ts poor wiring at some level and the house is poor wiring at a different level and who knows. Who knows? Well, here's to giving it another shot. <laughs> yeah, man. Hey. This is how the capitalist system is supposed to work, right? People give you bad internet, you take your money elsewhere. True, true. Speaking of music, Andrew, I uh -huh. did something pretty fun this past weekend. Oh, yeah? I went to a concert. Uh, we saw, well, we went to the Del Mar Races, uh, which is a set of, it's a racetrack for horses, for people that don't know. Uh, and we, you know, we bet on the ponies, because that's what you do uh, while you're there a little bit. Was anyone wearing a fascinator? Uh, no, I did not see anyone wearing any fascinators. There were people wearing hats of varying degrees of fanciness, uh, all the way up to like, you know, big, very fancy hats, but no fascinators, sadly. Uh, and, you know, I had a few drinks. I lost money. Stephanie won money. Everything was good. Uh, and then there's a free concert afterwards. So you buy your admission to the racetrack before the last, or like before six o'clock or something. And you get free admission to the concert at the end of the races. Um, nice. Who who does a racetrack get to cover it? Like a Jimmy well, Buffett sound alike? Or no. So there's a, a they do a summer concert series at Del Mar, and they have pretty legitimate bands. We saw um, Weird Al there last year. Uh, that was really cool. Uh, they are having Three Eleven there. They're having Modest Yahoo there. Uh, these are all prominent bands uh, yeah i'm not the big a fan of uh well modest yahoo 311's decent i like some of their music and then um who was the first one you said uh 311 modest yahoo oh um 
Now I've now forgotten who I told you it was. <laughs> We're good at podcasting, JJ. Yeah, it doesn't matter because I didn't see that person, so don't worry. Oh, the person well, I whoever saw. Whoever it was that you said first. Oh, Weird Al. Weird, Weird Al. Al. I have never understood, like, understand the jokes and all that, and uh, I understand the humor and parody and stuff, but mm -hmm. listening to albums and albums of Weird Al has never interested me. It's. I mean, it's a live show. You're not really listening to albums and albums of... No, 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 no. I don't mean that. But there are people that are like, Weird Al is the best. Okay. I mean, you know what I mean? Maybe they just don't like modern music and they enjoy the fact that he's making fun of it. Oh, I thought it was just like sort of in it for the lyrics, parody stuff, you know, Star Wars fans, that sort of thing. Yeah, uh, maybe. I don't know. Uh, but the person we saw was DJ Girl Talk. Oh, that guy's good. He's yeah. the one that uh, samples a ton of stuff uh, yep. and re. What is it? What is it called when you take the same beats and you stick them over each other? Uh, the term you might be looking for is mashup, but I think that that belies the amount of creativity actually involved. Uh, he does remixes. Is is what he does? Yeah, it's remixes and mashups, but at the same time, they're kind of all different because it's like a new piece yeah. of music. So he creates new music from samples and beats and lyric tracks and various parts of other usually popular or semi-popular songs. Uh, a lot of hip-hop, a lot of R&B, uh, some pop music, and then some like random deep cuts of stuff that he just likes. Uh, and he layers it all together at the same time. So you're hearing the words of a Kanye song, but the beat is from some Katy Perry song, and then there's little cuts in with other songs from other places, and it just ends up being a new thing, even though maybe you know the words already, but it doesn't go to the beat uh, or that you thought it did. I think a lot of people that know who DJ Girl Talk are are going to say uh, that we're overcomplicating this, and that yeah. it's just mashups, but I think it's just, it's kind of different music. It's not, it's, it doesn't sound like mashups to me. Yeah, I Normally, I think of a mashup as like you're just putting two songs together. This is a lot more complicated than that. Uh, and he did, he played live. And so live is really cool, too, because not only does he play, you know, tracks from his albums and stuff that he's done before, but he's layering in current popular music on top of those or in some cases in place of those or new tracks that he hasn't put out yet and stuff. That's legit, man. Yeah. That's so, pretty, pretty you know, cool. you hear the his remix of the... Uh, that Panda song uh, with the broads in Atlanta. And it's really awesome because it's that on top of like 14 other beats that are all sound really good. And it's a, some completely new thing yet, you know, the words already. Uh, nice. So it was really, really fun. Yeah. Really cool show. I'm a big fan of, uh, of live stuff like that where you kind of like can't replace the experience because yeah. there's no way that it's the same each time. Yeah. And the dude is manic on stage. He's like jumping up and down and like, you know, rocking his head to the beat and you know just like screaming every other you know like time between songs and stuff and like the dude is like i can't believe he has that amount of energy for an entire 90 minute or you know almost two hour set it was really impressive cocaine's a hell of a drug yeah maybe i don't know man uh but it was a ton of fun uh, i totally recommend if girl talk ever plays near you people go see him right on man well it's been a busy week around here uh so I promised a Bravely Default update because I thought I was going to end that chapter. Uh-huh. And then I didn't even get close. Oh, but did you play some? I played a little bit, but All I right. got a little distracted due to multiple things hitting at the same time that are all kind of related. Okay. Overwatch has sucked me into delving into a, putting a bunch of time into it. Okay. <laughs> Why because is that? after we recorded last week, basically the next day they put out their Olympic Games celebration, which they call their Summer Games celebration. Right, because you're not allowed to say the word Olympic uh, unless you're an official sponsor of the Olympics, otherwise they sue you. What? Oh, you didn't know about this? Come no. on, dude. Yes. The Olympic Committee is one of the most litigious people in terms of like trademark protection. So this is one of those things where it's like the big game instead of... The yes. Super Bowl. If you ever wonder why people talk about, like, they talk about, if you watch TV, which you won't be able to do soon, I guess, but if you're watching the Olympics coverage and they are, people are mentioning that 
oh, if you're out watching the games, or you're watching the big game, or you're out watching the summer games, they're talking about the Olympics, but they can't mention the name the Olympics because they can be sued. So are we going to have to bleep this whole episode? No, because they're not going to, no one is going to sue us. (laughs) Also, (laughs) we don't make any money off this. So what would they get? Good point. Good point. Yet, if you want to make money off this podcast, please contact us <laughs> at podcast at wewerdgamers.com. <laughs> oh, man. Well, uh, we are a little bit of an Olympic watching house, but the um, uh, Overwatch stuff is pretty cool. I don't know if people have seen it. For Overwatch, they're doing special loot boxes that have one guaranteed item from 100 plus items of summer game themed skins and sprays and voice lines and whatever have you that are all quote-unquote olympics related they are summer games related yeah it's pretty cool yeah um i like some of them a lot and i really wanted to get into it before they cut it off because it's cutting off with the end of the summer games yes so did you spend money on boxes or are you just playing to get boxes? Oh, no, no, no. I will not. Uh, I have paid them money to play that game. And right. in my opinion, if you're going to put in cosmetic items into a game that was paid for and not a free game, mm-hmm. paid for. Right. Like Overwatch. Yeah, like Overwatch. Uh, you know, you have to pay 50 bucks to get Overwatch. Mm-hmm. It's true. You do. I believe that if you're going to put skins into that game, they have to all be attainable by the average player. I don't say they have to be immediately available, but attainable, right? Like, and that's my theory and that's what I'm sticking to. So I'm not giving them more okay. money for that. Okay. Well, uh, so have you attained the skins you were looking for? Were you looking for some specific ones? I did get the Genji, uh, Japan skin, which looks really oh, cool. good. Yeah. yeah. It's the one where he's like all white and he has like, the little red The sun. rising sun, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, pretty cool. That's a good one. The other one I really, really want is the McCree, who's wrapped I in the American knew, flag. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. It's not only that, but his belt buckle changes to say USA also. I don't know oh, if you man. saw that, too. So it's pretty good, but like his McCree's a cowboy dude, right? And he's wearing a little shawl kind of duster thing, sort of uh, Clint Eastwood style. And they just change the texture on the shawl to be a kind of tattered american flag it's pretty cool not gonna lie i didn't realize though that a lot of people were really pissed off about this uh i'm not particularly mad i think people are mad about the sort of exclusivity of it and the fact that you can't buy any of the skins with the currency in the game yeah so they're not quote-unquote craftable right? right like you can't use your extra currency to get some of these things which is kind of a disappointment, I think, but their follow-up to that was, well, our summer games are going to be yearly, so yeah, these items will go into a vault, but they're not going to disappear from the game entirely. They will be earnable again. Right. So that was, you know, when I was sort of mad about it, too, when I heard about this, because I know I'm not going to play enough Overwatch in this time period to earn even close to the skins that I would want, right? There's also a really sweet animation for uh, the Rope Bastion where he puts on boxing gloves like a punching robot. Oh, like a rock'em sop'em? Yes, yes. It's really, really cool. But, uh, you know, obviously I'm not going to have enough time to earn even close to enough. And like you, I've sort of decided I don't want to spend more money on this game. So when they were like, hey, you know, we're, we're going to bring these back, you know, hopefully, you know, every year. It's like, oh, okay, all right. Well, if they bring the summer games back for like, you know, a month or something every year, as time goes by, eventually I'll have more time to play and be able to accrue these things. I just feel like it's it's in good faith for a paid game to not have things that are just like impossible to get or that disappear forever, right? Like, mm-hmm. I don't play tons of competitive mode, so I'm not going to get golden weapons. But I can get golden weapons. They're there. Right. There's right? nothing stopping you from getting it except your own ability or time to play the game. Right, exactly. So, like, these items going away and coming back doesn't bother me as much as long as they come back. You know, like, mm-hmm. just it just annoys me when they put stuff into these types of games, paid games, where it's like, hey, uh, you never had an opportunity to earn this, but some people have it. So how do you feel about the pre-order skins that are impossible to earn if you didn't pre-order? 
They were not a pre-order only. They were purchased within the first week. Oh, okay. Interesting. Because I don't... Cause I, so, but now they can no longer be earned at all. So, for instance, I did not purchase within the first week. I don't have any of those skins. Um... Hmm. I think that that's okay. I mean, it's like one of those things that, like, they made it clear that up front that these were going to be there at the beginning. Okay. I, I'm just interested in your opinion on it, that's all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I understand what you're saying and how... But I think that because of it was at the time of the game release, like, here's the option. Pay $10, get all this stuff that's extra that is only available now, mm -hmm. forever. Okay. Um, It wasn't like... Hey, the first hundred people to order get this skin. Sure, sure. It's that's the stuff that pisses me off. Pretty widely available. Yeah. Or like, hey, you had to put in six hundred hours in alpha to get this skin. Mm. That stuff is annoying. Gotcha. If it's widely available and then limited and then maybe goes away. As long as somebody had the opportunity to grab it, even if it was with money, then it's fine. Now mm. that the game is out, I would say like putting in $10 skins that then go away, is, that would set me off. Gotcha. Okay. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I see your uh, your point there. Anyway, that's probably enough about skins in Overwatch for people that don't care. But anyway, it's nice that it lines up with the competitive end of season because I'm going to try and combine the two. Mm. I'm going to play enough that I feel satisfied that I got some chances at some summer games skins and also get my 10 placement matches in for competitive because... And doing that earns you what exactly? I think you get a player icon or something. It's like season one. I don't know. Okay. It's just... I don't know. I just want to try the competitive mode and it's a good dual purpose thing because they end almost at the same time to try and sure. do both. And I'm not that far off. I hit 20. So... It's pretty easy to gain levels in that game. I think even at the level that I'm at, I'm maybe 15 levels or so ahead of you, um, maybe a little more. Uh, I can still gain about a level a night if I play, you know, several matches. XP plateaus in that game at 25. Yeah, so it's literally, you know, I play like a f several matches, and if you win like two out of three or three out of four, that's enough and gain a level. And there you go. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty good. Um, unfortunately, in quick match, when you're not on, I lose five out of six. Mm. Because people pick Triple Bastion on attack. Yeah, that's not the composition of heroes you want not on generally. attack. Or like no healers. Or See, Andrew, sometimes when no one picks a healer. I know, I switch. And it's then... got to be you, dog. No, I know. And then I switch, and then the whole team doesn't stay together. So you're like following around one guy. Yeah, and you get picked off because there's no one else stopping them from killing you. Yeah, it's a team game. Not having a team is tough. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, uh, that's probably enough about Overwatch, though. You that's should get cool. on and help me with my XP bonus, though. Yeah, uh, I have enjoyed playing some Overwatch with you. We even played a little bit last week. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great game. Uh, seems like there's still a pretty good community around it too for people that are interested. I think so. I think that in. it's. I think it'll stay alive for a while. Um, they're trying to do seasonal stuff. They're going to probably add some new stuff in the fall when uh, yeah. BlizzCon happens. So it should be good. Yeah, I My guess is we will see a new hero at BlizzCon. Oh, yeah, at least one. And probably my other guess would be talking about uh, switch up in the maps. Yeah, yeah. I would imagine at least one new map, uh, if not more. So that'll be exciting. Well, do you watch the Olympics since it's related to that? Uh, That's part one of why I'm... That I've been busy. Now, part two, the Olympics has, has come on. I'm so, going to keep saying Olympics because some It's fine. I think it's fine. Dumb. I think it's fine. Look, no one is going to care about what you and I do. Uh, I think... Uh, so I watch it occasionally if there's like an event on that I think is cool um, or whatever. I, I want to watch it live, though. I don't want to watch anything pre-recorded. So basically anything that's on based like normal NBC cable, almost all of that is pre-recorded. So I don't watch that channel pretty much ever i'll watch the stuff online or you know find uh videos of stuff that's you know particularly cool but you know um i follow it but like really 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 casually that's sort of my opinion yeah okay um we're kind of in the same boat katie really likes to watch the the replays on nbc she like fast as fast forwards through them until she mm -hmm. gets to the stuff she really wants to watch like swimming or 
cycling or things like that. And yeah, then, uh, I think that's a good way to do it. And then watches some other stuff online or whatever. But it's pretty cool. And I'm, I, you know, it's it's one of those weird things where you have no interest in sports, like swimming or whatever, and then it comes on and you get really jazzed about about it. And I think it's especially true this year because freaking Russians and their doping and all that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. There sort of has been a a lot of problems in the games so far, it seems. I just don't understand, like, uh, you're a huge international committee, like, how you're so hold, beholden to one country that you let people that have been caught cheating multiple times just, like, show up. You're like, yeah, sure, no problem, whatever. It's because the agency that accused them of cheating has no power. It can't do anything. It has no enforcement provisions. And the people on the actual Olympic Committee are all extremely corrupt and don't care at all. Well, our swimmers keep calling out their swimmers, and it's freaking awesome because they keep beating them. Yeah, I heard that uh, our boy, or our boy, I don't know, the, the United States' boy, Michael Phelps, won a gold medal, again, despite being kind of old for that sport. Well, and it's awesome, too, because like you've got our older guys for those sports, and then our mm-hmm. young women in that sport like a, I think there's a 19 year old or 18 year old or something Lily King that just dropped into the pool and knocked off the you know the most accused doper in Russian swimming awesome after calling her out <laughs> it's like that's pretty awesome generations of people doing it I would sidetrack us here a little bit do you know any of the rules regarding who's allowed to swim on the various like so for instance Michael Phelps won the medal that we're talking about in the four by one or 100 medley, I believe I, we, uh, my girlfriend and I watched the preliminaries or some of it was on TV while we were, you know, doing stuff. Michael Phelps was not a member of that team. We watched the entire race. He did not swim. Yeah. Your, um, your team per match just has to be set when they get to the pool, I think. Okay. So you can change people out. Yeah. So Phelps doesn't race prelims and I am, uh, relay because they don't want him to tire himself out. I see. Interesting. Which paid off considering he made up a second on the rest of the field. Oh no, I'm not. His... I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I'm just trying to understand the rules because it seems to me like what is happening there that the because then does everyone on the team get the medal? Because that guy who swam in the prelims doesn't get a shot at the medal now. That sucks. Yeah, I don't know how that works. I, I would assume you're part of Team USA and you just have to take one for the team. I guess, man, I would be pretty bitter. Well, would it would you be bitter if then you were in the final and you didn't make the podium because they didn't have Phelps swim? But at least I was swimming, and like I think the competitors want to compete, right? Anyway, I don't know. I, I was just interested in it happens all the time, right? And you, people get benched in baseball. Yeah, and no one wants to be benched, though, right? P- athletes at that level want to play all the understand. time. Understand? Yeah, I understand, but like. A coach understands also, like, looking at the prelim, well, we don't need to have our best pitcher or our best swimmer or whatever out there to sure. win this heat. We need, you know, our top sure, six. Sure. We don't need our top two. They can be saved for their individuals, et cetera. I mean, that's the coach's job. Yeah, totally. You're, You're on right. On the team. That's true. I'm, it sucks, right? But that's the – it's a relay. Yeah. It's not individual. Yeah. I would just – hope that those people who participated in the qualifying heats and stuff would would have a chance to get the medal I also. wonder how that works. I don't know. I, I wonder if they get a medal. Because if they didn't qualify in that heat, right, they wouldn't have even been in the medal race. Yeah, no, I would think that they would get one, but I don't know. I've never seen yeah. it. I don't know either. So this is just my question. So email us, podcast at wewergamers.com, and tell us how that works. I'd love to know. Yeah, somebody will know. Maybe Maybe somebody will text me. I don't know. The other part of the Olympics that makes me a little bit sad every four, two to four years, depending on which which one you're watching, is kind of like, oh, wow, there's a 15-year-old breaking world records. Yeah. What am I doing with my life? Well, you're not spending every single day training in one sport. That's what you're not doing. I know. It's just one of those reevaluative moments, right? You know? Yeah. I mean, you know, you look at, you know, professional athletes of pretty much any sport, and most of them are younger than us. Yeah, that's why I don't have reflexes for um, reflexes for being good at Overwatch. Yeah, because you're not a professional athlete, and uh, you know that's and I'm old. 
it was a lifestyle choice. Uh, in a lot of those cases, you had no shot at ever becoming a professional athlete because you weren't raised playing those uh, one sport, right? Yeah, you're pretty good at, at uh, being confident in yourself, JJ, I have to say. I mean, I'm confident that I would never have been a professional athlete. <laughs> <laughs> I'm horrible at everything. <laughs> uh. Oh, man. Oh, dude, I forgot to tell you. Okay. So speaking of terrible reflexes um, and sports and Overwatch, we tried that Lucio ball thing, which is yeah. um, soccer in in Overwatch. Right, yes. You'd have to have pretty good reflexes to be good at that to begin with. Uh, I mean, you have to have some reflexes, yes. Yeah. Did you hear about the bug that came in that game? Yeah, I saw some videos. They're pretty funny. People could somehow cheat or hack or whatever and put in for people that don't know other characters into the game. So I know a little bit about how that worked. And apparently there's like a split second of time at the very beginning where the character screen, you can make it pop up. And then in that tiny fraction of time, they're able to click on a person to get, you know, a different character to spawn. Oh my gosh. So you see people running around with Lucio can't hurt anyone in that mode. But uh, if they get another character like a Bastion and they just sit in the goal and kill the other team forever. I've The ones I've seen are D.Va and uh, Widowmaker people picked up. I saw Bastion and Reaper. But in general, the people uh, in, in the Lucio ball mode, right? You're playing soccer. There's no shooting. Uh, it's just sort of running around and punching the ball and sort of trying to you know, move it towards the goal on the other side. Uh, it's a lot like Rocket League, if people have ever played that game. Uh, but the <laughs> the other characters have no such restrictions, and they can totally use the guns that they all carry. Uh, and it makes it a little bit not fun, my understanding. Blizzard's response was, hey, people, don't do this. <laughs> yeah. Hey, there's a bug. Uh, we don't know how to fix it. Sorry. Yeah, please don't. Please, please yeah. don't do what you're doing. Please don't. They can't really ban anyone, right? Because it's just a, not really it's part of the game. They're not hacking. Yeah, uh, you know, it's a obviously, you know, maybe they'll penalize you by you know taking away your ability to match with. They'll put you in the like you know low priority queue or something. I don't know, but no serious penalties. I can't imagine. Well, Andrew, uh, were those the only two reasons that you've been busy this week? No. Okay. No. Part part three of three. Last week I talked about Monument Valley. Yes. Talking about Monument Valley made me want to play Monument Valley. Mm -hmm. So I restarted the game from the very beginning. Uh, it's not a very long game. I think there are, if you play the original game and both expansions, um, it comes out to like 22 missions or something, each of which has multiple segments, but 22 missions total. Mm-hmm. I replayed the whole thing this week. Wow. It's not very long. It really isn't. Um, uh, Monument Valley is a mobile game for people that may not remember our previous discussion about it. Let's let's backtrack for those that don't remember the previous discussion. It is a mobile game available on iPhone and I assume Android, but maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I don't know. I've never looked. Um, the best I can describe is a... Uh, platforming but not really because there's no jumping or anything puzzler with um a lot of mc escher style elements of um, mobius connections and stuff like that that you have to make to make your character walk along maps and um enter and exit the map right cool you have to get to the end um story-wise it's about a girl, I believe. It's a young girl. She's called a princess, so maybe she's older, but you can't really tell um, because this style is just a kind of a blank character. It's just mm -hmm. a, a white, you know, head and, and body walking mm -hmm. around um, who is trying to reactivate shrines of geometry, right? The whole, the whole story is about geometry and how people had this religion around it or whatever. There's actually a really deep story that is not entirely fleshed out. It's like hinted at 
you know, mm-hmm. and it's hinted at so that they can kind of give you a cool ending, which I won't talk about, so people can play it. Cool. Um, and you, they increasingly make the puzzles more difficult. You have to bring elements from other puzzles. There's a um, sort of a sidekick character that shows up once in a while. Um, and you, yeah, you manipulate the environments based on, on these tools that they give you to create Mobius areas that you can walk around and uh, cool. get to the end. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's a really fun puzzler. The thing that I didn't remember that I remember liking the most now, there is no timer and there's no score screen. Uh, so there's really no way to fail. It's just kind of like, hey, you got through or you didn't. Yeah, and and I believe this is true. There's okay. no way to die in it, and there's no um, irreversible mistakes hmm. in each level, right? You like you may make something harder for yourself because you did it backwards, but you can always backtrack or st- you know I guess you could start over if you really wanted to, but. You can always sort of backtrack and, and fix what you may have done out of order. Interesting. So there's really, yeah, so there's really no fail states at all. No, no, yeah. And the, the base game is okay. Um, it's, I would say, not very complicated. I got through the base game in like two nights. Um, and then they have one add-on called It Is Dream, which is one mission, a long one. But it's, uh, it was originally released for charity and then they gave it out for free. Um, that's very short. And then they added on something called the Forgotten Shores, which I don't know why they took these missions out, but they're all the like really mind bending puzzles. Oh uh, yeah. And I have to say, irrespective of the actual puzzles, the last two missions in the Forgotten Shores expansion had me going like, Oh, that's so cool. Oh my gosh, that's so cool. You know, like yeah. They had they keep adding elements in to these last two missions to just throw the book at you and be like, "Look at all these cool things we thought of," you know, mm-hmm. in our puzzling game. Sort of that mastery element, right? Like finally they're letting you put all the pieces together so that in the end you have completed, you know, the you've used all your abilities in interesting ways all together all at once, right? Yeah, there's really no... I mean, it's not abilities per se, right? It's or whatever, of, the mechanics of the game. Yeah, the mechanics, I guess. Because your character just moves, it doesn't have an ability. But you're right, adding the mechanics in. But they throw in three or four mechanics in the last two maps. That, that they don't... They're not confusing. You pick up on them immediately. Mm-hmm. But they just add this element of like, oh man, wow, I didn't, okay, so if I just keep swiping left here, like this is what happens, that's amazing, you know? I don't mm-hmm. want to give too much away, because I thought like, especially the second to last mission, I was just like, I was in awe of this mission, and how, I don't know why I call them missions, because they don't, if mission's the wrong word, because it, it's, it's not a, It doesn't matter, it doesn't yeah. matter what the word is. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Uh, no, it's okay. The uh, that's cool. I, that feeling of mastery and like overcoming a really interesting obstacle uh, is actually a lot of the reason why I like Dark Souls. And that's yeah. it. Sounds like you're getting those same kind of feelings out of this sort of puzzly ish kind of platforming game, and that's cool. I love that stuff. I really liked a game especially in the modern games and how everything is on top of you all the time. There's interfaces everywhere. There's, you know, buttons all over the place. There's timers, there's rushing, there's, you know, death, there's whatever, you know, everyone's adding mechanics to something all the time. Like, you know, okay, Mm -hmm. a simple game comes out like, um, you know, a FF tactics clone where you barely have any mechanics uh, because it's a base game. It's on mobile and then, you know, in six months or a year, they've added, like, social, they have media, they've got Facebook invites, they've got, you know, all sorts of um, microtransactions and thousands of characters that they've added into the game. And there's a Candy Crush mini game. You know, that sort of stuff just wears me out instantly. Mm. And this is just... You sort like, of feel like the initial hill is so high, it's not worth climbing? Yeah, or they add hills into the game that aren't are just don't need to be there. And this just was so crisp and clean the entire way through. There's no interface in the way. You just tap to move and you manipulate the environment, and that's it. Like, 
That's and cool. Yeah, it was just a really fun, fun experience and something I would highly recommend for people that are, you know. Andrew, I think you need to try playing. There's a few different games I think you need to try playing if you like stuff like this that's just really simple. And... Yeah, you should watch the videos of this because I think this is probably my current... Like, if I could find mobile games that were like this more often than not, because I tried... I tried other stuff from this company and they've got, you know, they've got their Flappy Bird clone and there's Angry Birds, but really what's the reward in Flappy Bird and Angry Birds and Pokemon Go? What's the reward of, where's the, the there's a challenge of it a little bit, but there's really not, right? It's just sort of like finger mm-hmm. mashing. Yeah, it's something to do. Yeah, uh, whereas this was more of um, a thought about experience. And this is what goes back to our previous discussion about paying for games, right? Mm-hmm. Like yeah. free-to-play and all that sort of stuff and how there's unfortunately very little mental value, I guess, maybe. It's it's definitely busy work. It feels like a, that's what the thing is. The free games feel a lot like busy work. Yeah, I think some of them are designed in that sort of space to just be things that you can do in little tiny chunks and not really have a cohesive total to them. Yeah. You could do this in tiny chunks though. You know, I mean, it ran in the background, so it saved where you were and you mm-hmm. could do one mission at a time and it'd probably take you 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah. It's uh, but I mean, there's it. Well, anyway, a lot of mobile games aren't designed to have that sort of cohesive structure to them. Uh, yeah. So there's, um, you know, there's there are a lot of games out there that sort of are there for like kind of artistic reasons, maybe more than actual video gamey reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, you should play a game called Journey. I think you'd really like it. Journey is a PlayStation game, though, right? Yes, it is. Okay, it's not on mobile, as far as I understand. But I do. No, it isn't. I've had. A, I've heard of Journey. Have you played it? Uh, I have. Uh, it's really good. Uh, it's on the playstation 3 and 4 and xbox no it's not on xbox Uh, i think it's just on the playstation 3 and 4 maybe it's on vita i don't know paint me a picture uh journey is a oh man it's been a long time uh but it's a game you control a a want a wanderer uh there's not really any speaking throughout the whole game uh and you have a scarf and your character platforms around in these areas to continue their journey it's there really isn't a lot of i I don't want to give away anything that happens in that game because there are some really amazing moments uh that people should see for themselves uh the music uh and sort of the the things that your character can do it's sort of important that you learn them through experimenting uh and it's really really cool yeah, it's definitely a game that was not made for everyone to like it. It was made as a, like, this is what this person wants this game to be. It's about this guy on a journey through these various different landscapes. This sounds extremely up my alley based on my takeaway from... But that's why I wanted to suggest it. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Well, should we work in our, uh, since we're talking about mobile games, our our weekly dig at Pokemon Go? Uh, sure, Andrew. Do you have a weekly dig at Pokemon Go? <laughs> we decided we had to take it on, right? It's true. We're against it now. <laughs> I, forgot, I forgot that that was our stance, but yes, I'm yeah. completely against it. We are totally in favor of people playing the game, but we're against it. Right. I think it's fun, and I understand the nostalgia. And I think that people are totally in the right to play it, Mm -hmm. but we're taking it on. Okay. Andrew, (laughs) give me the story. I want to hear it now. Dude, Niantic, the the people running that thing, Mm -hmm. I think they're just drowning. You think they're drowning? Just totally underwater. They don't understand how to fix anything. The whole thing is on fire. They Mm -hmm. shut down a whole bunch of third-party sites apparently saying, Mm -hmm. like, accusatorily, hey, we're having all these bugs, but also you're draining all our resources, so that's why we can't fix anything. Okay. Now, I hate to rain on your parade here, but did you see their justification for what happened after they turned those third-party sites off? Um, Did they bring back any sort of features that they took away? 
Uh, no, no. I think there was a patch recently that started rolling out some stuff that's similar to the nearby stuff that they took away. But they showed a graph of their server load, Andrew. And if you look at the loads on their server, there's like, you know, it, it's a it's a, a line graph, right? It's going mostly horizontal and up and down a little bit. And then there's like here, there's a line where we t shut off the servers. There's a literal cliff that's about half the height of the graph. And it falls down. They're like, and we shut all those websites down right here. And all this lower number is back where the servers were afterwards. That seems pretty justifiable to me. Okay. So it, I don't think they were lying or harassing those websites and saying that they were, you know, actually causing problems with their servers. Now, does that mean that they should have compensated by, you know, buying more servers or increasing their capacity? Maybe that's something they should also be doing. Um, you know, I have a feeling that in a year and a half, if those websites had come out, you know, a year later instead of the day after, uh, there probably would have been no issues. I think my takeaway isn't that they were wrong. I, I There's no way they weren't wrong, right? I mean, there's a service that is accessing their server and gathering information. Yeah. I mean, that means that there is data load happening. Mm -hmm. I don't think that it uh, obfuscates them from fixing anything, which it seems like what they were saying is like, look, look, this is going to fix everything, guys. Okay. I, okay. I, I, obfuscate maybe wasn't the word you meant there. But like, yeah, I understand what you're saying. It, it, sure, it doesn't absolve them of the need to actually fix their stuff. Totally. Right. Yeah, you're probably right. I said the wrong word or something. Totally. But that I, uh, I think I agree with that. But you know, maybe this helped them be able to push out the game in Brazil in time for the Olympics or something. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think the game came out in Brazil still. Uh, I thought I heard them say that they were trying to. Maybe it just hasn't happened yet. I don't know. Anyway, yeah. whatever. Not I our mean, problem, Andrew, me. because we're not playing. Yeah. It still gives me a sick pleasure. And then seeing, you know, people tying their phones to ceiling fans and breaking them because <laughs> because GPS rather than steps. That's on them, dude. They're dumb. <laughs> I'm never going to, I'm not going to tie my phone to a ceiling fan. That's just not something I'm going to do. <laughs> it doesn't matter what the reward is. You can't get me to do it. Cause well, you could get a magic carp. The consequence is going to be me, my phone breaking. It's not worth it. <laughs> you get one of the 75 magic carps you need to make a gear dose. But my phone is broken then, and I can't use it anymore, so... See? Yeah. So, listen up, people. It may be fun, but Pokemon Go will eventually break your phone. Yeah, it'll break your phone. Don't do it. Oh, man. You know who else is struggling, JJ? Struggles? The struggle is real. Where is the real struggle, Andrew? The Warner realest Brothers. struggle. Oh, man. Yes. Warner Brothers Entertainment. They did not have a good weekend. Uh, in which way was their weekend not good? I, I think that Suicide Squad came out and it, well, they thought, oh, look, those numbers on Friday are good. And then it fell off by half on Saturday. Yeah. So I did see Suicide Squad. Uh, I wanted to know. Is it still hashtag not your Joker? Oh, it's absolutely hashtag not my Joker. Uh, I don't think there's any person, I don't think there's any, I don't know that there's a single person who would say that they thought that he is the best Joker, right? Or that he is the Joker that should be in this movie, or that he should be in this movie. Do you follow <laughs> the oatmeal? No, I don't. Oh, man. He had a pretty funny joke this weekend. Which About was the Joker? No, he said his, his website, he put out a thing, and he was like, Hey, I finally saw the third movie in that trilogy, and it was Batman Forever, Batman and Robin, and Suicide Squad. <laughs> nice posters all next to each other. That That's a funny. sick meme. That's good. That's that good. Was pretty funny. I, really um, like that. I did not see it. So, should do you want to do a spoiler free, or do you want to do oh, a warning? Oh man, I want to talk about some stuff. Uh, right, okay, hold on. Okay, let's just do a big old spoiler thing, and then you can do whatever you want. All right. Yeah. All right. So people come back in, how long do you need, JJ? I, let's be safe and say 10 minutes, but it won't be that long, probably. Okay, give us 10 minutes if you don't want to hear Suicide Squad spoilers. Oh my god. The triple S. 
Uh, no, right. That's okay. Way worse than Triple X. Oh man, they're making one of those too. Did you know another one with Vin Diesel? I know. Oh my god, I'm so excited. Okay, uh, Suicide Squad. All right, up front, there's probably a good movie in there somewhere. I bet they cut the good parts of it out and left these parts and then added a bunch of stuff that makes no sense. That's my under my guess about what happened. Uh, I know you talked. Uh, on our previous podcast that there was some talk about reshoots and stuff happening very recently, close to the release of the movie, you know, in the yeah, last they several months. They reshot to add Batman and jokes. Yes. So uh, there are some jokes in the movie that uh, seem like maybe they don't make a lot of sense, or they're there just to like punch things up to keep them from getting slow or boring or something. Uh, and there's some fight scenes that don't really make a lot of sense, like why are they doing this or what's going on here? Um, so the, some of that stuff doesn't really make a lot of sense, like sort of why that's happening. Uh, so a lot of the characters don't get a lot of screen time. Uh, some of the members of the squad who aren't named Harley Quinn or, uh, Deadshot, who is Will Smith, uh, they don't get very much time at all. Uh, Rick Flagg, the leader gets a good amount of time. Uh, the Enchantress lady gets some good setup and Viola Davis, uh, carries the movie as Colonel Waller, uh, she's easily the best person on the entire movie, like actor acting wise. Jared Leto ruins every scene that he's in, except for the flashback scenes with Harley showing like her, you know, creation. Uh, so like those scenes are good, but everything else about him is horrible. I don't know why he's in the movie. Some things that I heard. One Waller was well acted, but made no sense. And Rick Flagg not standing up to her also makes no sense. Uh, I kind of understand the uh, reason why people. Uh, I can understand why he would not be standing up to her if she's his boss, right? That's like a thing. But she randomly just murders a room full of people, and he's supposed to be the moral compass of the movie. Yeah, I sort of think that. Deadshot is the moral compass of the movie, actually. Okay, so that's the other thing I heard was Deadshot ends up being the character you wish you just watched a whole movie about. Yeah. Yeah, he's really good. Uh, well, Will, look, Will Smith is a good actor, so, you know, he got he did some stuff that was good. <laughs> I can't remember who said this, uh, but somebody tweeted, Hey, you know what this Suicide Squad movie makes me think of? It's been way too long since a Will Smith blockbuster. <laughs> yeah, hey. I think it's going to be a little while longer, maybe. Um, I, I really feel like if they had spent slightly more time developing sort of the characters, uh, there's a, there's a Hispanic character who's the fire guy, uh, with all these tattoos and stuff. He gets about like five minutes of development in the entire movie, uh, and way too late. Some of that development comes, uh, it would have been awesome to have some of that stuff up front. Uh, he's also like secretly one of the best characters because of some of the awesome stuff that he does later in the movie. Uh, and like why, like. He is such a great character by the end of that movie. You're like so mad they wasted the entire previous movie not showing how awesome he was the whole time. This was my this was my greatest fear. This is what I yeah. said is that they were going to try and make Avengers with a bunch of characters you knew oh, nothing yeah, yeah. about with no yeah. previous movies explaining them. Yeah, totally. Uh but it like I knew that was going to be this going in though. And I was okay with that. And even still they they messed it up. Like, even the fact that this is a... Like, so the movie is enjoyable, actually. I enjoyed my time watching it. I didn't have, like, a bad time. Uh, I think a lot of that is the fact that the boring scenes, or the scenes that would be boring, are carried by the music. Uh, the soundtrack is pretty good, uh, in the same way that Guardians of the Galaxy had a really good soundtrack. They sort of did a very similar thing and played some stuff over it. Uh, so that picks up a lot of the scenes that might otherwise not be interesting, because there's a cool song that you like playing over it. Uh, a man, just some of the plot decisions make literally no sense. Like why Enchantress builds this giant machine it, it's because humans are worshiping machines now instead of her because she's an ancient something never really explained what she is ancient magic, something and humans used to worship her 6,000 years ago and now they're worshiping machines. So she's going to build a machine to destroy everything. That's really never explained, but it, I don't know. She does. And she starts blowing up satellites for some reason. That's not why. I I don't know. There, it, a lot of weird stuff happens, man. I kind of wish they would have 
tried to explain some of it a bit better. <laughs> but, you know, the scenes where, you know, we, we learn about Deadshot and his daughter are really great. Uh, even the scenes where Batman shows up actually are pretty good. I don't really mind any of Batman's appearances in the movie. I think they're fine. Interesting that you said that learning about Deadshot and his daughter was okay. That was one of the other complaints that I heard was like, "Oh, people didn't like that." I thought no, it was they like, just "Didn't like." They didn't like that. Like, oh, I'm walking down a street and I see a mannequin, and bam, flashback. Ah, uh, I don't know. That's like a super common storytelling device in movies. Whatever. I don't see any problem with that. I think the flashbacks actually are some of the better stuff in the movie. It's like I said, the only scenes that I didn't hate Jared Leto in were all the flashbacks where he's with the Joker and Harley Quinn together. So it sounds like the only complaint I'm hearing from you is like the premise of Enchantress and Jared Leto. And that other than that, you thought it was a great movie. I don't know that I thought it was great, but it's, you know, it's like the case where the clearly in the scenes that were in this movie, I, you can tell there's like some stuff there that's all really good. And maybe it needed to be edited differently, or maybe there needed to be some more around this little early area, like, but not a lot more, right? It's like, in the case where, like, I want to see a director's cut of this movie, actually. Like, I bet the director's cut of this movie might be really good. Well, they said they shot enough. They said they shot enough for a, um, a Joker movie and something else. If they really, like, they could have done a whole thing's worth of footage, hours and hours extra. Yeah, so I would love to know what those, some of those scenes are. And I'm sure not all of them work, and, you know, maybe all a lot of those scenes they shot were garbage or didn't turn out good, they didn't make any sense. But I wonder what the director's cut of this movie is, because I, I sort of feel like we got clearly something that was meant to appeal one way. It was a movie that, like, two movies existed with these same characters and themes, and they sort of shoved them together in kind of an ill-fitting way. Uh, and that I wonder if they took like some of the plot elements and stuff from this one and some of the other things from this one, if you could create a better movie, if only one person was deciding what was going on. Like two movies, like one for fanboys and one for the general public or like two movies, like uh, no, two the, writers got in and wrote two different stories and they mashed them up. No, more like uh, the movie is trying to do two different things at the same time and it didn't work. Right. If they had picked, we want to be this fun, rompy comedy movie the whole time. They could have done that, but they didn't. So they have all these like really dark moments and kind of very introspective scenes where the characters are learning things about themselves, you know, and Will Smith doesn't want to shoot Batman in front of his daughter. And, you know, there's all this like, oh, the Harley Quinn is like, you know, considering killing herself in order to be with the Joker and this kind of stuff, like some dark stuff. And then, you know, the like the next scene they blow it all off when Harley Quinn shoots a quippy line and they have a fun pop song playing and they fight bad guys. It's like, okay, it's like very manic uh, sort of switches back and forth here. And they probably could have made a good movie in either of those two styles with these characters and this sort of plot, basically. But they didn't really commit one way or the other. And so it just feels like two visions sort of fighting each other all throughout the movie. And you don't really get a good... And it doesn't come together as a whole well this is what happens when you have 19 people at the helm and no yes. one is able to pen anything on their own yeah also Zack snyder is not a great person to be running the vision for your universe let's say hack snyder yeah Zack I snyder i don't ha i don't like bagging on people especially ones that make millions more dollars than me doing stuff that obviously they are better at or I, look, I'm not going to say that I could do better. I can say that I don't like his output. <laughs> and that's what I was it, about to say is like, yeah. I, I don't like bagging on people, but uh, Zack Snyder has a uh, dubious track record with yeah, his, movies where he has given people money enough times, especially comic book people that yeah. I feel like yeah. it's enough to say enough. Please I mean, stop. Yeah. The, uh, the, let's see, 300, uh, Sucker Punch, Man of Steel, uh, Batman vs. Superman. All of these movies have big, big problems. Watchmen. Watchmen, yeah. I actually ended up like, I like Watchmen, but I have a lot more reverence for that movie and the source material than I think almost most people would. I've read the book like seven times. It's a great it has book. has nothing to do with the movie. <laughs> true, true. Uh, I think the director's cut of that movie is a lot better than the movie that got shown in theaters, but it's also like three hours long. Uh, 
yeah, I don't know. It, Watchmen was the best of those movies in my mind. <laughs> Not that it's like some kind of masterpiece of cinema or anything. Uh, and this kind of goes up there along with, uh, I think this is better than Batman vs. Superman. How about that? All right. So, so, you know. Suicide Squad officially better than Batman vs. Superman. B plus. Um, mm, B minus. B minus. Yeah, yeah. Batman vs. Superman is like a C. This is like a B minus. So forward progress, I guess. Uh, there's a there's some good setup in there for the Justice League. Um, so that's fun. And hopefully, you know, hopefully they keep they get their stuff together. I don't know. I'd like movies to be good. I guess they just need to keep at it and course correct as they go. They can't start over, right? Yeah, it's too late, right? You got to imagine they already have two movies in the can, in theory, coming out, you know, in the next year or two. So, yeah, Ugh. Suicide Squad. <laughs> I really liked I I enjoyed watching it, but man, you could just see the parts where you're like, oh, this could have been better. Why did they do this? Why is Jared Leto in this movie? <laughs> <laughs> I really think that um, if they had picked a wet paper bag or <laughs> anything else, I think you'd walk out of there. And have been psyched about this and movie? And you'd have been like, Andrew, I have to tell you that everyone on the internet's wrong. This movie was fantastic. I, man, just... Hashtag uh, wet paper bag my joker. <laughs> wet paper bag my joker. Yeah, I, man, just... Uh. And the fact that he plays him as super crazy all the time is fine. The joker is supposed to be crazy. And Harley Quinn's character acts that way also. She's a very, you know, manic and switching back and forth and very crazy all the time. And okay, and like, you know, maybe the heart of gold thing comes through and like that works out. But like, man, just, uh Jared Leto's acting is just so, uh I can't. <laughs> I just don't like him. I just don't. Something about him. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway. All right, that's really all I wanted to say about that movie. I, I hope Wonder Woman from the trailers does not looks pretty good. I hope they don't mess it up. I mean, it's already done, right? So. Uh, and it doesn't come out. Till, it doesn't come out till next year, but I suppose they've wrapped shooting, right? So I think they're pretty much whatever they got, they got. And maybe they can edit a little bit or something, but it's not gonna. So if we hear about reshoots for that movie in the next month or so, we're in trouble. <laughs> be real, real, real worried. Yeah. It, because if any of them have to be good, it has to be that one. Sure, yeah. And, you know, like, you know, I saw this with my girlfriend, and she even commented that, you know, she, was, she thought that DC, the universe in general, has done a lot more to have, you know, better women characters than the Marvel Universe does. Uh, maybe in the past. Uh, I don't know how much, you know, she's just commented in the recent movies. Um, there seems to be more, you know good women characters in the DC movies. And uh, a lot of people would argue that the I, uh, love I, interest in Superman is not very well suited for advancing women's. Yeah. I place. maybe made some of those arguments, uh, but you know, in any case, that's a perception thing uh, and a female leading role as the superhero uh, would be pretty cool. Hopefully they get it, get it right. I would agree with uh, Stephanie that DC started the ball. I mean, they were like, hey, look, women are powerful figures. They need their own characters. And then yeah. Marvel has slowly caught up. Yeah. Um, and I think if I think back on it, that even, you know, like Black Widow is still pretty tertiary in terms of her. Yep. She doesn't make any decisions or anything. Yep. That was some of the stuff that Stephanie was saying. It's, you know, it's like, hey, some of the people in those Marvel movies, they're just kind of like there. It's like, yeah, yeah. They're, they're women and they're supposedly cool like everyone else, but they're not as front and center as they are in some of the DC stuff. So. Marvel TV has much more of the strong female vibe going on. They've had um, Sky on um, Asian of S.H.I.E.L.D. They've got multiple female characters on Daredevil, Electra, and okay. um, Night Nurse. And they've also got Jessica Jones, and they've got... Well, neither she nor I watch any of the TV stuff. So. Yeah, no, no, I know. So in the the weird thing about Marvel is that they they're like, oh yeah, it's all the same universe, but it isn't though. But right? it, yeah, the TV and movie don't done one never crossover. The never the Twain they, shall meet, right? Yeah, Agent Carter kind of came from the movies and had her own TV show for two seasons. Um, which you know, Agent Carter, she's a yeah. female. So but yeah, other than like bringing stuff from the movies to TV. 
nothing from TV seems to make it to the movies. And I really, really wonder if any of those characters like Daredevil or those guys actually make it to a movie, if they'll recast them. Oh, I bet they never do. I bet they don't come. I bet it goes one directional, right? I think you're right. That makes more sense to me. Especially given their distribution platform. You know, yeah. They're mostly online, other than Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., which was probably moving to Netflix pretty soon because mm -hmm. their ratings are headed downward. Um, Agent Carter just got canceled. So I would assume basically Netflix is going to be their distribution. Yeah. Or, you know, if not Netflix, then, you know, Hulu or any of these other kinds of online platforms well jj netflix and disney are super buddy buddy and disney owns abc and abc produces marvel tv and therefore marvel is on netflix Ah, uh, okay i did not know uh that netflix was buddy buddy with disney yeah they basically have a rotating crop of all access pass to disney movies oh you know i interestingly because after i watched suicide squad uh, I went back and watched Guardians of the Galaxy again because I wanted to remember if it was as good as I remembered it was. Is it? Yeah, I love Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, I can All reaffirm right. the fact that that movie is one of my favorite movies Marvel has ever produced. And we're still friends. Yeah, that's a great movie. Um, the soundtrack is beyond phenomenal. Everything that happens in that movie is either funny or intended to advance the plot. It all works together. There's a vision. God, it's so good. It's like everything that I wished Suicide Squad was. Yeah. That's what a, do you know? Yeah, nice little spoiler-free discussion there for people that tuned back in. Um, <laughs> you know why that movie was so good? No. Because it was directed by the guy that did Rocketeer. Uh, James Gunn, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I did not know that's what you were going to say about that. But yeah, uh, anyhow, that movie was great. Uh, and man, I just wish that other one had been better. <laughs> did you hear they're making a Rocketeer, another one? Oh, are they? That's interesting. Yeah. That's a deep pull. That was like mid-90s. Oh, I know. So they're making a Cold War Rocketeer, hmm. um, which is a sequel. It's a reboot and a sequel. So like Cliff Secord is not the Rocketeer. Okay. Because that movie took place in like World War Two, right? Yeah. Like very beginning World War yeah, II yeah. before the actual war. So this will be post-World War Two. Cliff secord has gone missing during World War Two. Oh. Uh, and there's a new Rocketeer, possibly African-American female pilot. Mm, that's cool. Which could be cool. Uh, and she is doing stuff to fight the commies, but also try and find out what happened to Secord. Mm, cool. No word on, on who is directing or what yet, I don't think. Uh, so all of that will subject to change then. Uh, but... Sure, yeah. But it sounds like a cool concept, like taking the Rocketeer... Yeah. Into like a uh, maybe a modernization, like like they could do a bunch of movies to get it caught up. Yeah, that could be fun. Yeah, that'd be cool. Rocketeer was a really fun movie. Um, that's awesome. JJ, Andrew, do we want to drag this into Hearthstone Land, or do you want to go to uh, an email? Oh, we have an email too. Yeah, we got. Oh gotta, man, we got. We got. If we're gonna run another half hour or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a lot of stuff happening this week. I want to talk a little bit about Hearthstone. All right, let's do it, um, because I know that Karazhan is going to launch before our next episode, so I figure we should cover a little bit of yeah. all the cards that just came out, and in particular, one let's... card that has caused a hubbub. In the community, yes. Uh, so they re Blizzard revealed all the cards to come out in the new expansion, One Night in Karazhan. Uh, a lot of some cool cards on there. Uh, it looks like there's going to be some good stuff, some interesting cards, some fun cards. Uh, and one card in particular they revealed. Uh, in fact, uh, right as Andrew and I were about to record, there was a designer insight from the lead designer put up a YouTube video about this card, Purify, for the priest. And this, people in the community have called this card the worst card created in Hearthstone. Worse than Magma Rager? I mean, yes, come on. yes. Definitively worse. I would rather have Magma Rager than this card. So, uh, you know, it's a, I don't think it's a stretch to say it's the worst, but it's like, maybe it's not the absolute worst, but it's the real bottom, right? Like it's the bottom of the barrel. This card is horrible. So they've made an argument since the very first expansion about why games need trash cards. Yep. And I continue to try to understand that argument and I continue to not really see it. I see under, I see blank cards. I see 
base level cards, but I don't see actively detrimental or subpar. Like right, like uh -huh. like you're saying, you could take arguably the worst card in the game, a five one for more mana than it's worth. It will do nothing before it is dead. And you would take that over this card because this card probably in 99% of scenarios actively does nothing. Correct. So, in fact, this card, the reason Magma Razor, that card you were describing before, is better is because there's a chance that that card will do something good for you. This card, its ability is to silence a friendly minion and then draw a card for two mana. Now, the draw a card part is actually really good. The fact that you only can silence friendly minions is really bad. Well, it makes it a combo piece, right? And a combo piece for only this set, right? Because they've removed... If you play standard, they've removed from standard basically all the cards you'd want to silence your own minion, like a Death Lord or, um, you know, any of those detrimental effect cards have now all cycled out. So... Not true. There are still some. There's still there's actually enough you could make a deck with, but they're not. It's not a good deck. Sure, exactly. Or you know, like okay, well, you could silence your ice giant charger thing that, or you know, that can only attack minions. Or the know. best example I've heard with this, and the one that he brought up in that video is there's a new card coming out in Karazhan, uh, Barnes. He creates a one one copy of a thing. Uh. If from your deck, right? It takes one of the things in your deck, brings out a copy of it, and turns it into a 1-1. One, one. But it still does whatever else the card does. If you silence that thing, it turns back to its original stats. So that's a cool idea. Oh, say I have this gigantic minion like Deathwing or Ragnaros in my deck. Well, I silence it. I get a 1-1 one, one copy of this guy. I silence it. Now I have the original stats of that guy for the cost of Barnes, which is, you know, three mana. Four mana, sorry. So that's a really good combo right there. That's a six mana combo, though. Yes, it is, and that's the problem. The fact that this card is two mana is horrible. Priest has a zero-cost card called Silence that does the same effect as this card, but doesn't have the friendly-only restriction and doesn't draw a card. It costs nothing. It literally just costs you putting the card in the deck. That's it. It costs okay. zero for that, and for this, with a restriction which makes it less useful, and cycling a card costs two mana? That's a joke. Horrible card. And so, you know, they, you know, Blizzard came out and said, oh, we're trying to pull back on the power of silence. We don't want it to be as good as it is and or has been in the past. And so, you know, this card was one mana, and now it ended up at two, and this is where we thought we could allow people to have fun with this or whatever. The problem is that just Priest is a completely horrible class and standard right now. They have, like, no good decks that are playable on the ladder, right? I'm not quite sure that they're right about pulling back on silence. They've done what they've done in the last couple sets, uh, this one and the the one coming and the previous one on pulling back on silence, pulling back on charge and pulling back on removal has ground games to a halt in terms of well, I have my one drop, you have your two drop. Yeah. You yeah, know, I have my three drop, you have your four and it's just like back forth back forth yep. oh you got your one removal card and i have nothing and i can't recover Done. Yeah. and you can you can concede by turn five you know who's gonna win yeah it has a, removed a lot of the well also they've sort of removed buffs from the game like reasons to want silence like there's very very few cards that target your own minions and increase them in power i mean even in wild where the cards are you know there's still available crazy cards Mm -hmm. All the cards in both sets, standard and wild, seem to be pick the best card for five mana that you can get. So, like, you know, it, it, okay, well, I can get this card for five, or this oh. minion for, pick the best minion. Basically, fill out your deck with the best minions for mana cost. That's all you gotta do, you know? And Nazoth sure. is probably the leader of that. Mm, I, yeah, I mean, Nazoth is insane in terms of what he does for the mana cost, right? But it's more... You're talking about a fundamental issue with the game and that the game is based around who can play better curves uh, in terms of like who draws the better cards or whatever. That is that is an unresolvable problem with Hearthstone. The, Hearth, the game is always going to be like that. Yes and no. I mean, it wasn't for a long time in the middle there, you know. There were there were catch-ups. There, like there was a sure, chance. If sure. I draw this, 
not only will I be able to clear his board, but I'm going to have a chance to stabilize. Mm-hmm. There's really no chance to stabilize anymore. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it, the chance to stabilize is much less. It, it comes earlier than it did before, and that's unfortunate. I was talking to Ryan the other night, and it was like, basically, if you know for a fact by turn four that you haven't, like, drawn into anything, mm-hmm. you know? So, like, so let's say one, two, turn one, two, and three go by, and you haven't drawn a minion, you might as well concede. Yeah, it depends against the deck you're playing, but, yeah, that could be true in some cases. Yeah, I, anyway, I mean, you know, I, that's... I don't understand the argument for making bad cards, but maybe you can explain it. This, this is going to turn into more of a game design discussion than a yes. and stone discussion, I think. But game the, the, design-wise, I understand having baseline cards. Like, well, that card's okay. You know, like, you can't have every card mm-hmm. be breaking the mold and, and just have huge So, Andrew, effects. here, let me... I think you're thinking about this the wrong way. No matter what you do there will be a worst card. I agree with that. I'm saying okay. the no, worst just, card hold on, should... hold on, hold on. Stop. Uh, I just want to orient your, your thinking and see if this helps you with what you're thinking about. So no matter what, what happens, there will be a worst card, right? Just like philosophically, you can't... unless you, Or, in order to prevent that, you have to make every card so similar that there can't be a card that's better than another card. Right? So... Those are kind of like the two, right? Either you have a card that's the worst card and a card that's the best card, or you have all the cards on a like extremely level playing field. Well, if you don't want all that because it's boring, then you have to have a worst card and a best card, and they're just sort of abusing the fact that you can clearly put cards near the top or near the bottom. I sort of think that's like in theory what they're trying to do. I just don't know how successful they are at any of that. I understand what you're saying, and I understand the point of having quote unquote bad cards. This card, unless this combo of Barnes and Silence and all that sort of stuff turns out to be like gangbusters and no one saw it coming, I can just tell you it doesn't matter. It's not going to be good enough. Okay. The, the like the inconsistency around that is not going to be. It's like it, it's like you know the the fact that you can do it isn't enough to make it good. I agree with you. Um, having come from playing years of card games, I would never try this combo. You know, right? You would lose so many games trying to pull it off. But his point is, oh, but people like playing combos that are you know not great because they have fun playing. And it's like, well, yes. not not on the ladder. They don't. Not at well, all. Well, so his opinion, uh, and he expresses this in the video, is that it create people enjoy it, that it's fun, uh, and that. They enjoy, some types of players enjoy these kinds of combos and these kinds of decks. Clearly, you and I are not this type of player because we think this card is horrible and we will never use it because it's so bad. So, unless there's mechanics in games like curses in um, in that one game. Uh, Good old that one game. <laughs> the card, the deck building game. Uh, oh, um, Dominion. Dominion. So, like, Curses and Dominion, right? Those are detrimental cards for a reason. Mm-hmm. Um, I understand having bad cards, like baseline cards that are blanks, that are exactly on or under curve. Why mm-hmm. would you put a card that is this negative into the game, into a class that's just, like, known going in? Struggling. Struggling. Yeah. For, for three patches. Yeah. So, it, you know, he says in the beginning of the video, uh, you know, they feel like they misread the community sentiment or whatever. I'm sure that's them covering themselves. But uh, they did say that they're going to remove Arena or remove Purify from the Arena drafts for Priest, which is nice because that card is completely horrible and it's a common. Do you think uh, Warriors wish they could do that with uh, uh, Song Commander? I th- Well, maybe, but it, it, I feel like that card, because Warsong Commander has a body, it's already 10,000 times better than this card. Yeah, I know. So, you know, uh, it's at least, you know, they realize that they've kind of been treating Arena pretty badly uh, in the past. This is the environment that they've created. See, listen to yourself. And that's my main complaint with the design. And maybe what will change with this set because they've added the portals. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the main thinking is, uh, I don't know, just take a minion. 
You know, like a minion's always better. Why would you just not take a minion? And that's everybody's deck design right now. And it's just like there's no opportunity because there's no good. I mean, spells that's and the removals and yeah. So you know, I, I, you're right. I mean, that's the game is designed to be a game about minions. So I can't say that you're wrong if you just pick the best minion at every level. That's gonna be a okay deck. You're not wrong. That's how the game is designed. I'm, I'm voicing a little bit of frustration because I took a couple months away from doing more than just dailies, you know, mm -hmm. with Hearthstone, hoping that maybe I was just burnt out on it or something. And I tried pushing a little bit this last couple of days, and I'm just I'm struggling to find the fun in winning, right? Like, I guess I could find the fun in playing in casual and playing crazy decks, but even people in casual just play the same decks as in standard, so there's no point. Well, um, you should come to Wild. <laughs> I, I've tried Wild. Um, I it's have basically been... just Secret Paladin. Okay, well, uh, I've played the last two days uh, Wild only. Yeah. Because I've been trying to get my 500 wins on my Paladin. I'm pretty close. Okay, and you've uh, been playing Secret Paladin? Nope, I've uh, been playing Paladin, but it's like a Nazoth variant. Uh, there's no secrets and there's no mysterious challenger. Uh, and I haven't faced a single secret paladin. Uh, I faced a couple of warriors, a couple of shamans, a rogue, a priest, two priests. Uh, I think that, oh, a couple of mages. So like, you know, that's a really good class variety. Like priest. Okay. Oh, that's a class. Interesting. That's fun I to will, play against. I will put this to you. I have basically done the five wins a day with a class. Mm -hmm. for the last week um and i've done it all in wild because i'm i just enjoyed wild a little bit more and same actually two, yeah i enjoy it more. two out of three every single day two out of three is a secret paladin so consider the times that you're playing then i guess uh i found that playing at different times of the day results in extremely different opponents i believe it um, that was a theory that Stephanie put forth to me, which I kind of didn't believe, but I, it's very hard to argue with evidence. Uh, I, I play during lunchtime and the quality of my opponents, uh, is quite a bit lower. And then I'll play again at night after I get home from work and the quality of the opponents is much better. And also they're playing like way more savage decks. Interesting. Well, you can't so, argue with her. She's a smart lady. I think there are some good cards in the Karazhan expansion though. Uh, I don't know if you have any that you want to talk about? I know we've talked about a few already. No, I would just want to say, like, I'm excited for Karazhan because I really, really like... I think I said this on the last one. Mm -hmm. I wish that all expansions were adventures. I, yeah. I really think that that's a missed opportunity in this game that they could be doing a lot more of. Yeah, I think it's... Uh, I think they don't like doing them because in terms of production time and stuff, they take a lot more time. On their end, I'm just saying what I for enjoy. Less I don't really care what their, their problems I know, I hear, are. I hear you. Uh, for less payoff? Sure. In terms yeah, of I mean, money. I'm sure they make tons more money on the, on the actual packs. huge card expansion sets. Yep. Uh, and tons. that's unfor that's unfortunate uh, because I think the adventures are the best stuff in Hearthstone. Um, Hands and, down. Yeah, really, really good. And uh, I hope this one's good too. Uh, I won't be buying it because I have a bunch of gold saved up. Uh, so... But that's, uh, you know, I hope people like it. I hope it's good. That's uh, And there's some cool cards in there, you know, despite the we talked how much this one particular one was horrible. Yeah, no, I'm sure we'll talk about it next week once the first wing's out or whatever. But there are some decent cards in there, and it'll be interesting to see what happens. All right, well, before this episode turns too long, do we have an email, Andrew? We do have an email. It is related to... Board games, cool. Oh. We got a good response on board games. Um, we should do more board game things. I would love to do more board game things as soon as I play more board <laughs> games. <laughs> Andrew and JJ, I enjoyed your talk about board games in last week's podcast. What game would you suggest for family gatherings like the holidays? Something suitable for all, for all ages, youngsters to grandparents. Love listening to your show, Jamie. Okay. Uh, let's see. Family oriented, huh? Well, Settlers of Catan is always good, right? Youngsters to grandchildren or to grandparents. I think 
youngsters can play Settlers of Catan. Base base Settlers of Catan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Base the the normal game. I think you can get kids as young as like six or seven into that game. Base Carcassonne, very good. Yeah, yeah. Carcassonne, the the tile laying game, right? Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that, um, there's not too much in way so, of complicating that one. So we talked about Catan last week. Catan is a game um, where you set up a map. In a what is it a hexagon? No, yeah. octagon. Octagon. What, what's how many sides are there? Six. It's six. It's yeah. It's a hexagon. Hexagon. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's a hexagon. Uh, you randomize resources and then use the resources to build cities, roads, and settlements to try and score victory points to win a game. Um, and it's all done by rolling dice and collecting cards, which are the resources. That's yeah basically the game the first person to 10 wins yeah and the game is relatively simple there's not a ton of rules uh it's all about rolling the dice and picking up your resources um it's it's eat grandparents definitely can play it young kids can definitely play it uh it's a that's a good game for everyone Carcassonne, similarly it's about building a a map this kind of you know placing it one square tile at a time and you place them in ways that make sense they have to connect in ways that make sense, and those, the ways that are the rules are pretty intuitive, I feel like. Uh, it's like, oh, hey, the roads have to touch other roads, and the pieces of the cities have to touch other cities, and the, the fields have to touch other fields. That's most of the rules right there. Yeah, it's basically the end-all, be-all of the rules, and then you score points based on what you connect and build over right. the course of the game. And then when you run out of tiles, you're building the city and a uh, map. You, the game's over, and you just tally the winner yeah uh the scoring and stuff gets a little complicated but you know if the kids are you know of age to do basic math they should be able to figure that one out um if you're into card games like uno and things like that um and you're a little bit savvy flux is a decent game oh yeah flux is really good it's a card based game where the only rule to start the game is draw one play one that's right. Everyone has a hand uh, of cards, you know, like in like in Uno. Uh, and then on the cards are various things that happen. Some of them change the rules of the game. So you put a count of card, and now there's a new rule in play as of when you put that card down. It sounds more complicated than it is. It's really pretty straightforward. Every card says exactly what it does. Yeah, um, you just read it and do whatever it says. Yeah, and so you kind of build a strategy around adding more rules to the game so somebody can change it to say draw four play one or draw four play four or what have you and then someone will eventually put out win conditions which is get these two cards in front of you and then you can also put out the cards that are in front of you like i don't know uh, they call them keepers in the game so it's things you keep in front of you like a notebook or a pen or what all those sorts of things or the moon the moon toast yeah. yeah exactly and it's uh, random stuff. Yeah, and the first person to hit all that stuff wins. Yep, and it's really cool. Yeah, that game's really fun. Uh, it changes. It's a lot more fast paced than some of these games. It kind of just moves. You know, yeah. it's like four people. Really good game too. I think if, if if I was going for pure simplicity, probably Flux of those is my top choice of those three. Yeah, it's a really good game. Uh, you know, you're sort of limited in the number of people that can play that. I think four is the the max there. Maybe uh, Flux. No, maybe not. I don't know. Is there a max? It's like six. Okay. As many hands as you can deal, basically? Uh, no, 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 no. There's a deck, because you have to draw. Oh, right, right, right. I think yeah, it's I six. Know. Whatever. Flux That's is That's a good point. Are we overlooking anything that could play more people? Resistance, maybe? Uh, the resistance is cool. Uh, there's a but little, again, there's might be too many rules in the resistance. There's a decent people. number of rules. Uh, also, it takes quite a while. Yeah. Okay. Um, but that, Resistance is a great game uh, for maybe older people or people who really want to get into a game for a while. Yeah. Now this is this is overlooking like the basics, you know, like Stratego. And this is, sure. This is like actual uh, designer board games, maybe. Yeah. Or you know, sort of off the beaten path kind of board games. Look, anyone yeah. can play Monopoly. Um, but these are interesting ones. All right, my pick's Flux. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good pick. I'll stick with Catan, but uh, I think that Flux is a really good one, too. All right. Well, thank you, Jamie. Anyway, how can people uh, ask us questions about board games so we talk about them more, JJ? Well, people can 
send us emails at podcast at we were gamers.com. Uh, we have a Facebook page, which is we were gamers. We have a Twitter account, which is at we were gamers, which you can follow. Uh, and we have an Instagram, which is also we were gamers and people should follow that too. Um, uh, you should review us on iTunes or Google play. Give us those stars. We love them. They're the best. Any number of stars is fine. Yeah. Preferably five, but if we didn't earn five, it's okay too. Then only give us four. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I need some help uh, getting extra experience in Overwatch, so let's get out of here. Okay. Let's get out of here and play some Overwatch, Andrew.